Hello and welcome to our second live event tonight. It's time for our IVF webinar uh, for today and I hope you can hear me well. I am your host Caroline and another topic we have tonight and with us uh, is uh, you can already see him. Uh, we have another doctor, another expert to help you out with your questions. Hi, Dr. Alfesh, how are you feeling today? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, please let me know if you can hear me or we are having a slight connection issues with the doctor. Please let me know. Everything was working just a minute ago, but I don't think he can hear me. Please let me know, okay? Okay, you can hear me. So uh, it looks like we are having slight problems right now, but please stay tuned. I will disappear for like one minute, okay? And we will be right back. So don't go anywhere. We are definitely trying to fix this for you. All right, and we are back, and I hope you can actually uh, hear me. Dr. Alfesh, can you hear me now? I can, certainly. Thank Perfect. you. Happy to hear that. So don't worry. Uh, just let us know that you can hear us both, and it looks that everything is working now. Apologies yeah. for this, uh, but uh, those things can happen. Perfect. Thank you for confirming that all is good, and we can uh, hear each other. So hopefully no further interruptions okay perfect thank you so much again as i mentioned we are having another ivf webinar and i just want to mention that stronger together initiative has been uh, brought to you so that you can ask your questions be top fertility experts for various uh, clinics and of course tonight i also uh, would like uh, to remind everyone that uh, the stronger together initiative has been brought to you also thanks to our ambassadors and partners and they you can see them right here right now and again tonight we're having another topic definitely interesting one uh, on pre-implantation genetic testing a patient's guide and with us we have dr alpesh doshi who is a consultant clinical embryologist and co-founder of ivf london so hello to london i am happy to know that you are here with us and uh, i hope you can still hear me and all is okay <laughs> i can thank you perfect so uh, we will start with a presentation that will take up approximately 30 minutes and after that we will go for your questions all you need to do is just simply put the que those questions in the chat section and well uh, that is it from me at this point Okay, uh, Dr. Afesh, are you ready to? Begin? I am. Perfect. Let's go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Caroline, for the kind introduction. And lovely to connect with uh, a lot of uh, the patients who are potentially looking to get a bit more information on pre-implantation genetic testing. Uh, by way of introduction, as Caroline said, I'm a consultant clinical embryologist. I've been working in the field of IVF for too long now, for about 25 years, and uh, yet the field is so rapidly developing. And I feel we're still very much at the tip of the iceberg in terms of how many discoveries have been made. I mean, we wouldn't have realized 
um, you know, 20 years ago that we could test human embryos for genetic disorders. And I'm going to be telling you everything about it today in terms of where the technology is at the moment, what the pitfalls are of genetic testing, what are the risks, and potentially what are the benefits. So I also want to let you know that PGT is very close to my heart. This is one of my main areas of special interest, and I um, follow it very closely when it comes to developments, even in terms of technologies in the lab. So uh, I want to start off the talk by just telling you what my talk is going to exactly cover today. I'm going to be talking about what genetic testing is, what is PGD, what is PGS. PGD stands for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Pre-implantation genetic screening is PGS. What are the methodologies around it? And of course, what the benefits and limitations are. And this is going to be in general what my talk is going to be focused on. And after the introduction to the whole PGT side of things or pre-implantation genetic testing, I'm going to be walking you through the journey of IVF and how PGT becomes an element of an IVF journey, just so that you can link all the blocks together from a patient's perspective. And of course, as Caroline said, please do feel free to put any of your questions in the chat box, just so that we have an opportunity to answer them. And again, if time runs out, uh, Caroline will send me those questions via email, and I'll be very happy to answer them going forward. So we know that reproductive genetic testing can be happening in various forms. There is something called preconception testing, whereby if a couple know that they carry a genetic disorder in one of them, they may just want to get tested to find out if it's a genetic disorder, which is going to be trans, uh, transposed over to the offspring or their babies. We also know that patients can choose to have pre-implantation genetic testing, okay? So this is when we screen their embryos for this genetic disorder. And there is prenatal genetic testing as well, whereby the patients can test the pregnancy to see if it's got a genetic disorder or not. And what we're going to be talking today about is the middle bit there, which is pre-implantation genetic testing, which is the testing of the embryos. Because potentially, we don't want a pregnancy to start, which is affected with a genetic disorder. And that is the whole idea of pre-implantation genetic testing. So, if we start off with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and without using too complicated terminology, because pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is now referred to as PGTSR and PGTM. But again, the tech, you know, the, the, uh, the, um, the words can be quite technically challenging, so we're not going to be going into those details. We're just going to for the ease of communication, we're just going to refer to it as PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. What this is, is screening for a specific genetic disorder that a couple may carry. And examples of this genetic disorder are cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs syndrome in, in Jewish couples, breast cancer, such as the BRCA1 and BRCA2 two mutations, Thalassemia, um, which is again quite um, prevalent in uh, uh, Asian populations, or even sickle cell anemia, which is quite prevalent in Afro Caribbean populations. So, again, they could be very population specific genetic disorders which may be transposing over from generation to generation. By and large, a lot of this genetic disorders can um, persist in the form of what we call a carrier status, meaning that the patient who has that genetic disorder or carries that genetic aberration would feel no different and would be absolutely fine. But if two carriers come together, if the husband is a carrier and the wife is a carrier, then they certainly have a risk of having a baby that is affected 
from that genetic disorder, okay? And cystic fibrosis is, what, uh, sorry, um, uh, see, cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia is one such genetic disorder whereby, you know, the patients can be affected if two carriers come together. So pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is the screening of a specific genetic disorder which a couple may be aware that they carry the gene mutation for or the gene aberration for. And they may well be preparing to make sure that when they do decide to have a child, they want to have the embryos tested so that they do not pass over these faulty genes to the babies and they can eradicate this in the future generations. Okay, so that is the advantage of uh, having pre-implantation genetic diagnosis in couples who know of a genetic mutation or aberration. However, in many families or couples, they may not be aware that they carry a genetic mutation. And the only way they may have known about it is because they either have an affected child or they may have had a miscarriage or a termination because they have found out that their child is affected with a genetic disorder. And this is of course very sad because ideally these couples would have also preferred to start the journey knowing that the child is not affected with the specific genetic disorder. Now, patients that actually go through PGD are not necessarily infertile but they have to go through the IVF journey in order to collect their eggs and create embryos outside the body because we want to screen these embryos. We want to test these embryos and hence you've got to be able to create these embryos outside the body in the laboratory. And as I said, some of these couples may have uh, had an affected child. There is something called a savior sibling whereby they may have had an affected child, but if genetic testing can help them uh, identify an embryo, which is a genetic match from an HLA perspective, and again, without getting too technical, I want, what I'm trying to say, if there are certain of these cells that can be a genetic match to the affected child, from the second baby that could be born from a tested embryo, then that can save the life of baby number one. So baby number two can save the life of baby number one by some of these cells that are taken from, uh, fr from the placenta or the stem cells as we call it, okay? So those are called savior siblings. And as the name suggests, it is purely to save the, you know, the, the, the child number one. And again, there's some ethical dilemmas about it, but we're gonna stay away from the ethics and really focus our talk on the science around PGT, okay? And as I said, the whole aim is to identify embryos without the genetic disorder. So what are the options for patients who essentially know that there is a genetic aberration in their family history or even with themselves. Either they continue to take a reproductive chance, either they remain childless, either they get pregnant naturally, especially if they can get pregnant naturally and they do not have an infertility issue, and then risk having a termination if the baby or the fetus is found to be affected from the genetic disorder, or alternatively have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to screen the embryos. The other options are to either go for egg or sperm donation, depending on who carries the genetic disorder, whether it's the male or the female. And of course, adoption is always an option too. The decision-making is often governed by various factors and not just one. It sometimes depends on couples trying to identify what is the age of onset of this disorder that they're talking about. If it is a very late onset disorder, i.e. if it only affects the, you know, the, the life um, of, of the child in the, when they're 30s or 40s, then they may take a call 
not to do the genetic testing. Or alternatively, they also may look at what is the penetration rate of the disorder. Is it very severe? Are, is, is there medications available that can help combat the genetic disorder or elevate the symptoms that the genetic disorder may have? Is there any kind of surgery that can help correct it? And again, all these things play a role in a couple's decision-making whether they want to go through PGT or not. So we know for a fact that patients who present for pre-implantation genetic testing either have an objection to termination, and of course, it's quite a process to go through, and hence, many couples who do come for PGT have either <clears throat> been through the journey of having a termination or an affected child. It can be that a patient would have infertility issue as well as knowing that they carry a genetic disorder. For example, there are some chromosomal abnormalities called translocations. And in men or women who have translocations, and specifically in men, we know that the sperm count can be highly um, low in terms of, of, of um, the normal parameters. So men with a translocation may have a very, very low sperm count. And hence, they would also find it very difficult to try and get pregnant naturally. <clears throat> and as I said, either patients who have gone through um, or are candidates for PGD may have had terminations or may have had repeated miscarriages as well. And I've also spoken about savior siblings. <clears throat> but you can see on the graph that there's various many different types of genetic disorders we can screen for. Over 300, 400 genetic disorders that can now be screened for at the embryonic level. And the list is growing by the day. <coughs> so moving on to PGTA or PGS, pre-implantation genetic screening. This is a bit different. What PGTA stands for, or as I said, what this means is that what we're trying to look for in these embryos is that all the chromosomes which are necessary for the embryo to develop normally are present in a balanced manner. So giving you an indication or an example of what these chromosomal errors can be, you may have heard of something called Down's syndrome or trisomy 21. This is when the embryo has three sets of chromosome 21 or three chromosome 21s, okay? And hence it's called trisomy 21. And there is many such chromosomal aberrations such as trisomy 18, such as trisomy 11, or many such chromosomal errors that can happen at the embryonic level. Now, the bad news is that some of these chromosomal abnormalities can result in a live birth, such as trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, or even Edwards syndrome or Patau syndrome. Okay, so these are all abnormalities that can lead to a live birth. And of course, we know that some of these genetic conditions are quite debilitating in terms of the health of the resulting child born from it. So what PGTA is, it screens the embryo for all the chromosomes. And the way different from PGD is that the PGD is looking for a very specific area on the DNA to see if there is any specific genetic disorder which the couple may know of. What PGS is looking for, it's looking at the total number of chromosomes that are present in embryonic cells. So it's not telling you anything specific about a genetic disorder. It is purely characterizing and picking up abnormalities which is related to whole chromosomes rather than specific locations on the DNA. <clears throat> so how does this help IVF? We know from data that half of the embryos 
that are potentially produced in an IVF laboratory are chromosomally abnormal. And this may be the reason why patients may fail to get pregnant because these embryos may not implant. If there is something chromosomally wrong with an embryo to a very large degree, it will prevent that embryo from giving a pregnancy full stop. And it may just result in a negative pregnancy test after an embryo transfer. However, some of these chromosomal abnormalities can lead to implantation, i.e. resulting in a pregnancy, but it will lead to a miscarriage going forward, i.e. there may not be, have, be a fetal heart when the patient has the first scan. Or, as I said, in some cases whereby these embryos can lead to a live birth, you may also, or patients may also have a baby that is born from a genetic uh, disorder, such as a chromosomal disorder. Now, this is what PGS does, which is screen the embryo for the 23 pairs of chromosomes, okay? So we, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. <clears throat> so going forward, we're going to then be talking about specifically what this involves. As I said, with PGS, we are screening for the 23 pairs of chromosomes, which are potentially called aneuploidies. So these chromosomal errors are called aneuploidies in technical terms. And as I mentioned earlier, they are responsible for a lot of the IVF cycles not working simply because the, abno uh, the, the embryos are chromosomally abnormal. However, if there is a genetically or chromosomally normal embryo found as a result of PGS, then the chances of that embryo implanting and resulting in a live birth is much higher, much, much higher. And most importantly, it goes hand in hand with saying that if you do transfer what we call a golden embryo or a euploid embryo or a genetically normal embryo, then the miscarriage rate is also very low. Generally, this technique is advised in couples who have either had repeated implantation failure or have had repeated miscarriages, or even are much older in age, i.e. women over the age of 38 or 39, who would like to optimize their chances of getting pregnant or, and shorten their time to pregnancy. So here we are, we talked a bit about the indications of, of uh, uh, PGS. Advanced maternal age is one of them. Recurrent IVF failure is another. Recurrent miscarriage is another one. And again, the, um, the goalpost is shifting, I feel, because many clinics in the US, for example, are routinely applying PGS on every patient purely as an embryo selection tool. So many patients and doctors would probably agree with the notion that why not use this technique if it's available, even in patients who are potentially 32 or 35, because what we're trying to do is use this technique as an embryo selection tool. Because even younger patients may have a small proportion of their embryos that are chromosomally abnormal. So why not weed out those embryos and consider only the transfer of the genetically normal embryos. So the stages of pre-implantation genetic testing include producing I uh, embryos by IVF. As I mentioned earlier on, IVF is a prerequisite in order to do pre-implantation genetic testing. Then we have to perform a biopsy of the embryo, whereby we're taking a small sample of the cells from the embryo. And then finally, the stage at which the diagnosis happens is the genetic testing, whereby these cells are sent to another external laboratory, genetics laboratory, that will do the complex genetic testing on these cells and then give us a report on which embryos are genetically normal and which ones are abnormal. So 
starting on the process of IVF, and I'm going to kind of go through this quite swiftly rather than dwell too much on it, because I know that the topic today is purely PGT rather than IVF. But I just want to map and join the whole process together for our viewers and listeners. The process starts by the woman having an ovarian reserve test, which is looking at a blood hormone called anti-mullerian hormone. And we would also potentially do a antral follicle scan to see how many antral follicles are present in, in the woman's ovaries. And this gives us a good indication of what we call the ovarian reserve or the ovarian potential of the woman. Needless to say, in the process of PGT, one thing which is very important is the numbers and the number of eggs, for example, because we know that in some cases, the rarity of finding a normal embryo is quite it's quite large. I have had patients whereby we've had 10 eggs, 15 eggs, and not had a single embryo which is genetically normal from a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis perspective. And again, this really varies on the specificity of the genetic disorder, because in some genetic disorders, you could find a lot of normal embryos. And in some genetic disorders, it is very rare to find a genetically normal embryo. And Savior siblings is one such um, aspect of genetic testing whereby it may be very difficult to find a genetically normal match to that baby number one. And sometimes I've seen couples have to go through two, three cycles of IVF to find that one embryo that can save the life of baby number one. Going back to the process, so the ovarian reserve test is something that the woman would have to have at the outset of the whole journey when they begin considering PGT. There are some treatment exclusions. Obviously, women who've got a very low BMI would, would not be suitable for treatment. Women with very high BMI would also be encouraged to lose weight before they have any kind of assisted reproduction. And of course, age being one of them, because we know that with higher ages, there are increase in chromosomal abnormalities is quite fatal and quite quite intense. And hence, we would strongly recommend that IVF should not be used in women over 50. <clears throat> and many clinics have got policies of not treating women over 44, 45. Okay? But the ovarian reserve is very important before you decline treatment to a patient. So many of you may have already heard that the process of IVF starts off with a consultation and there's always going to be various elements of counseling that's going to be involved in the treatment, not necessarily just, um, you know, emotional support, but genetics counseling as well. So certainly it's for those of you who are <clears throat> considering pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, it is very important <clears throat> to understand that genetic counseling is also quite an important part of the whole process. There will be a lot of blood tests that both the male and the female would need to go through, which is called the virology testing, that which is a sexual health screen, which is again part and parcel and quite mandatory of the whole IVF process. <clears throat> Additionally, and we'll be talking at the end uh, in terms of the COVID and, and how what further testing is going to be recommended for patients going through IVF in the COVID pandemic, but we'll 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 talk about that a bit later on. <clears throat> so typically, the process of stimulation starts on day two of a woman's cycle, okay? The various protocols that can be used in terms of stimulating the woman to produce eggs or the ovaries to produce eggs, but typically in the most frequently used protocol is the short protocol. And usually this starts by stimulating the woman's ovaries on day two of the cycle. And typically she would attend the clinic every three days for a scan, two to three days for a scan to see how those follicles are growing. And once those follicles have reached a good size, then there will be a procedure called egg collection that will be performed. Typically, the stimulation lasts for around 12 to 14 days. So hence, in those 12 to 14 days, the ovary is making the eggs, and then the eggs are going to be retrieved from the ovary by doing a 
procedure in theater, which is about 30 to 40 minutes, a needle is going to be passed through the vaginal wall and all the follicles are going to be aspirated. And the embryologist is going to be collecting all the eggs and then fertilizing the eggs in the laboratory. <clears throat> and this is uh, just a video of showing how we fertilize these eggs in the laboratory. And we'll ask Caroline to play that video for us, please. And what you'll see is here we have an egg and the egg is just held in position by a pipette and the needle on the right hand side has got a sperm in it and we're gonna be bringing the sperm right near the egg and you'll see it, there you are. You can see the sperm right at the tip of my pipette and this is then going to be injected straight into the egg and the sperm is gonna be released in the middle of the egg. So there we are, we've broken the membrane of the egg and we've just released, we're gonna be releasing the sperm into the egg. And ICSI is generally used as the method of fertilization in most patients having pre-implantation genetic testing. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna detail a bit about the development of the embryos. So what happens on day zero, on the day of egg collection, this is what we see, we get the eggs. Then we fertilize the eggs by ICSI. The following day, we would see what we call a normally fertilized egg, or you can see two dimples sitting in the middle of the egg. This denotes that the egg has successfully fertilized. One dimple has all the genetic material from the egg and the mother, and the other one has the genetic material from the sperm, okay? So that is a normally fertilized egg. We expect around 75% of mature eggs to fertilize. And of course, from then on, for the next five days, the embryo keeps on developing from two cell to four cell to eight cell to what we call a blastocyst. And by day five, the embryo is around 150 to 200 cells. That is a blastocyst. And this is the stage that we're really interested to biopsy the embryo and take the cell. Now, I also wanted to add that we now have very sophisticated technology in the lab that also has elements of artificial intelligence built in. So the equipment I'm talking about is called the embryoscope, which has a camera built in into the incubator in which the embryos are being cultured. And these are taking images of the embryos every 15 to 20 minutes. And we'll ask Caroline to play that video for us, please. And you will see that here we are, the embryo is dividing to two cells, four cells, eight cells, and then we're going to be making a small opening by a laser to make sure that the embryo starts to hatch at the blastocyst stage. And here we are, it's starting to hatch. And the reason I want to show you that was so that I can tell you exactly what does the embryo biopsy involve. So you have seen that video, which shows you the development of an egg to a blastocyst. And what happens next is when the embryo has made it, and we'll again, we'll, we'll, we'll ask Caroline to play that video because from an embryologist's perspective, you have various such images of embryos that are being cultured in the laboratory. Again, uh, what the embryologist does is looks at the very specific timelines on each of these embryos and sees which embryos are developing normally and which embryos are showing some form of aberration just from the division perspective. So the embryoscope is a very, very important tool, in my opinion, which gives the embryologist so much information about uh, how uh, these embryos are developing. Anyway, going forward, as I said, the aim is to make sure that we get blastocysts. And as you saw in the previous video, you saw how the development to the, to the blastocyst happened. And here we have a blastocyst, which is about to get biopsied for genetic testing. So we'll ask Caroline to play that please. And you will see that here is a blastocyst. These cells in the middle there where my cursor is pointing is called the inner cell mass. And that is the cells that gives rise to the baby. And this layer of external cells here is called the trophectoderm, or cells that give rise to the placenta. So the biopsy that we are taking is from this external layer of cells. 
So here we are, these are the external cells. And my pipette there is just going to be pulling on some of these external cells or trophectoderm cells. And we have a laser beam there and I'm going to be applying the laser beam to cut some of these cells very, very carefully. And again, some of you might think that, it, or may ask, that is this a traumatic procedure to the embryo? And this is a very relevant question to ask. And the answer is that if it's done skillfully by embryologists who really know how to biopsy the embryo well, the embryo does not feel any of this pain, okay? So the trauma is very, very minimal. Potentially the gain from this information is a lot more. Here you are, you can see that we've taken a small biopsy of these cells, which is gonna be sent for genetic testing. And you saw that the embryo on the other side is absolutely intact and hasn't really felt much. So we'll move on to the next slide, please. So then the biopsy, as I said, gets sent over, but the embryo has to be frozen. The limitation of pre-implantation genetic testing as it stands is that you potentially cannot do a fresh embryo transfer. You have to freeze the embryos and then rely on doing a frozen embryo transfer, which is absolutely fine because the procedure of freezing works amazingly well. We know that 90%, 98% of these embryos survive amazingly well from the frozen procedure. We also have enough evidence to suggest that the pregnancy rates with frozen embryos are as good as fresh embryos. And typically the move amongst most of the clinics nowadays is to move towards a frozen embryo transfer because there are many studies that have shown that the results could be better in a frozen embryo transfer compared to a fresh embryo transfer. So in our clinic, we certainly perform 90% of the embryo transfers are with frozen embryos. So we then move to the embryo transfer technique, which is very straightforward. And again, as I said, that we'll talk more about the genetics of, of this talk rather than the procedures of IVF. But the embryo transfer is also a very important technique that needs to be given a lot of attention. So usually we perform this under ultrasound. And once we have identified which embryos are the golden embryos, as I, as I said, I, I termed the name golden embryos based on the genetic status of the embryos. Once we know which ones are the golden embryos, we would transfer one of these embryos back inside the uterus. So here in this ultrasound, you can see that this is the uterus as seen on ultrasound. This illuminated uh, tube there gets passed into the uterus. It's a thin plastic tube. And then the embryo gets released into the endometrium cavity or the uterine cavity. So we often take the decision of how many embryos to transfer very uh, seriously as well. It is our um, efforts to minimize multiple pregnancy and yet to keep pregnancy rates quite high. And by again, doing pre-implantation genetic testing, we believe that we have that selection tool whereby we can keep the pregnancy rates high up as well and yet minimize multiple pregnancy. And again, I'm very proud to say that at IVF London, we perform single embryo transfers in almost 95% of our patients because we know that a multiple pregnancy has many risks, not necessarily just you know socioeconomic risks, but maternal complications. It can lead to miscarriages as well. It can have a premature delivery of the babies that will spend a bit of time in the incubators developing their lungs, etc. So again, these risks have to be taken a bit more seriously. <clears throat> we have a comprehensive laboratory at, uh, on site, and this is just some images to show you what our clinic um, facilities are like. We are a comprehensive fertility center that performs all IVF and genetics solutions to fertility treatment. So that's our laboratory where we perform all the embryology, that is our theater, and we are equipped with a full anesthetic machine on site as well to make sure that we offer ultra safe care. And that's our recovery area. That is our consulting room. And that's just our waiting area and, and reception as well. And again, just as my final slide, I know some of you may be really worried about 
how to embark on treatment when it comes to COVID-19. And again, I just want to reassure you that um, firstly, clinics are going to be doing everything they can to make sure that they minimize the risk of any transmission of the virus uh, in between patients, between patients and staff, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about all the efforts that clinics like ourselves are going to be taking when we reopen. And we are all going to be re reopening quite soon because now applications have started to the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority where clinics can apply to reopen uh, their services. So social distancing is going to be the norm. Of course, in clinic, all the seating arrangements, uh, patient appointments are going to be well spaced apart to try and minimize patients hanging around in waiting rooms together. And again, social distancing is going to be the norm for the next few months. There's a very active disinfection and cleaning regime that is going to be used in the clinic in between patients and all staff are going to be making sure that disinfection is at the paramount of the whole process. Even the lab protocols and processes and the clinical protocols will have to be optimized and are already optimized to ensure that there is effective and very rigorous disinfection of beds, um, ultrasound probes, etc., etc. All our staff will be given personal protective equipment, gloves, masks, gowns, aprons, visors, to make sure that when patients are being treated, they're taking adequate precaution in terms of personal protection. And of course, you may know that if patients become COVID positive during the journey of fertility treatment, their treatment may be postponed till later. Video consultations or telemedicine is going to be the norm in many clinics. And a lot of the appointments such as nurse consultations, doctor's consultations, history taking, consent forms, prescriptions, everything will be done digitally via telemedicine or teleconferencing. I hope you found that um, talk a bit more informative, linking the basics of pre-implantation genetic testing and walking you through the entire journey of how it starts off from diagnosis to treatment. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, and I can see that there's quite a few questions that have, that have come up. So thank you for that, and thank you for your attention. Perfect. Thank you so much for that very impressive, very interesting presentation for all the details. And well, as you uh, see, there are plenty of questions ready. And I just need to apologize because unfortunately we cannot do it the normal way, okay? Because uh, we are having some technical issues when it comes to uh, presenting the questions on the screen, okay? But don't worry, we will manage. Um, Dr. Alpesh, you will be able to see that see them in the chat section, okay? okay so yes. let's, uh, I will be reading out them uh, okay. for you, but of course you can see them in the chat section. Mm -hmm. So we need to do it this way today. Okay. Uh, Hope that's okay unfortunately this is this hasn't been fixed they are working on it uh, but uh, we still can do it right mm -hmm. yeah. perfect so we have a very first question okay so first one is i have implantation failure diagnosis embryos with pgt negative transfer or biochemical pregnancy always embryos were from one cycle doctor have tested sperm with fish could be a problem with embryos should we make chip fertile I am 35 and husband is 40. Okay, so you've asked um, some, some very vital questions there. Um, what I am not understanding is if you have had any kind of pre-implantation genetic testing or PGS done on the embryos. Because what I would suggest is if you have had implantation failure, but you have also said that you've had a biochemical pregnancy. So what presumably you mean that you haven't had um, a, a pregnancy to, to term. So I'm assuming that that has obviously been a missed miscarriage. So I would definitely suggest that both you and your partner have a initial genetic test called a karyotype done, okay? Whereby they, it's simply a blood test to make sure that you or your partner are not carrying a genetic disorder that you are unaware of. I'm sure that is normal. And if it is normal, then I would suggest that you do end up screening your embryos 
in the next cycle with PGS. Doing a sperm fish may not give you the entire story because it's not always the sperm that results in chromosomal abnormalities in the embryos. It could be the eggs as well. And sometimes it's what we call post-zygotic or purely derived from the embryo or not even necessarily to do with the egg or the sperm. The embryo just develops these genetic disorders as it develops. So I certainly recommend that you do do PGS. Your question about Fertile chip, this is, I refer, I, I believe it refers to sperm DNA fragmentation, selecting the most healthiest sperm. There is no harm. The evidence is very limited, but uh, certainly there is no harm to use it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And the patient actually has added that uh, they have done karyotype. Yes, the, okay. the information has been added. Uh, so if you have any other comment, just go ahead and type it in. Okay. And in the meantime, let's get to the next question we have uh, from Marina this time. Is PGTA or PGS recommended for donor eggs fertilized by my partner spermatosa? It's a very good question, Marina, because in theory, if the donor is young, then there shouldn't be a need to screen the embryos. But we know for a fact that even in young patients, although the the rate of genetic abnormalities is very low. It's not zero. So some papers have suggested that even in young women, you can have around 15 to 20 percent of the embryos abnormal. Now, I want I want you to understand that genetic abnormalities is part and parcel of embryos developing. But yes, the rate of these chromosomal abnormalities is much lower in younger women. So I presume when you talk about donor eggs, I'm presuming that these eggs are coming from young donors. So the need for genetic testing would be quite low because they are bound to produce quite a few healthy eggs. But it's not to say that there is no genetic abnormalities. And hence, if you really want to shorten your time to pregnancy. I have known of patients who have combined genetic screening even when using donor eggs. All right, perfect. Thank you so much once again for that question and your answer to it. Uh, next question is uh, here. I am 40 and my partner is 43. What important pre-implantation testing should I be doing on our embryos considering the tests are very expensive? You are right. Um, um, the tests are expensive and typically to add on PGS to your IVF cycle, it can cost up to 500 pounds per embryo. So depending on the number of embryos you have. And again, there is a cap on it. So many clinics would not charge you over a certain amount. And certainly at IVF London, we charge per embryo and then we have a cap over over uh, a certain um, over a certain number of embryos that patients do not get charged more but you're absolutely right in saying that this is expensive technology and but again you know if you're 40 your partner's 43 and again i'm not saying that there is a sperm related genetic impact here but we know that in women over 40 the chances of chromosomal abnormality can be quite high in their eggs and it would not be wrong to suggest that you may see a benefit in using PGS as a combination to your IVF treatment. Because what you want to try and prevent is just transferring embryos and then finding out that either the cycle has not worked or most importantly, you get pregnant and you it results in a miscarriage, which is absolutely the thing you do not want to go through. So this is where PGS really has the edge, in my opinion. Excellent. Thank you so much for once again answering that question. Um, next one is up right here. My question refers to egg donation and PGT. There is a test, I think, called KIR, testing the immunological uh, comp compatibility between donor and recipient. Would you advise to do this test to prevent later preeclampsia? So this question actually sits out of my remit as an embryologist because I'm not an immunologist. So I would kindly ask you to kind of ask this question to a uh, an, to, to an immunology specialist. 
And I appreciate that there's quite a bit of immunological testing going on in reproductive medicine nowadays. And again, a lot of it is very, very controversial. We don't know whether it actually does have a benefit in terms of the outcomes. So I would certainly recommend that you speak to someone independent, someone who knows the subject well, and immunology sits definitely out of my boundaries. So I'm sorry I can't answer that question. Okay, thank you still for that. Uh, and well, there is another question that is like two parts. Okay, so have a look at it. So how debilitating is hemachromatosis, sorry, 63 ASP identified in HFE? If both donor and husband have this, I've been told it uh, may affect children after 40, 50. So what you have, so, so firstly, they, Angela, there's so many, there are so many different genetic disorders that it's almost impossible to keep on top of every one of them. So presumably you've had genetic counseling over a specific uh, genetic disorder that you know of, which is hemochromatosis. Uh, so it would be very important that you essentially follow the guidelines of the genetics counseling, because again, as doctors or as embryologists, we would not know the conditions or the impact factor on every of every genetic uh, abnormality or chromosomal abnormality, because there's hundreds, especially the single gene mutation, and this is a single gene mutation. So I would strongly suggest that you seek genetic counseling, which I'm sure you potentially already have had, and even if you need to know what is the penetration rate of this in your embryos, I'm sure the genetics counselor may have said that is it 25% of your embryos may be affected? Uh, is it 10%? Is it 50%? So all these will really have to be factored in before you decide whether you want to have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And again, as I said, some couples may take the view that if it's a late, a very late onset genetic disorder, how severe is its effect so that they can take a calculated call on whether they want to combine pre-implantation genetic testing for this specific genetic disorder? Perfect. Again, thank you so much for explaining that. Next question is right here. Multiple hereditary, sorry, osteochondromatosis could cause implantation failure? In my opinion, no, because this sounds like a single gene mutation. But again, as I said earlier, it would be difficult to know um, each and every genetic disorder because there's hundreds of them. So this also sounds like a single gene mutation. Again, I would seek the opinion of a genetics counselor because they can review the what we call the genetics report. Because if either one of them is a carrier or both of them are carriers, they need to look at what the recurrence rate is. So do seek that opinion from a genetics counselor, especially if you know that this specific genetic disorder sits in the family's history. Now, um, I don't think this is to do with implantation failure, but again, it may be. So you want to make sure that you do seek an expert opinion from someone who has worked with this specific genetic disorder. Okay, again, thank you so much. Next question is right here. I have read stories of women in the U.S. insisting on transferring a PGTA abnormal embryo, not mosaic, and giving birth to a healthy baby. This concerns me. How can this be explained? Okay, so I will explain this. So, oh, you, you have said not mosaic. So generally, in the U.K., we would not transfer abnormal embryos. So when an embryo... so so. Let me first say that no technique is infallible. Every technique has an accuracy rate of not 100%. So with PGTA, there, there is a 98% accuracy rate in terms of what the cells are going to be. And then just the biology of embryos is as such that some of the cells around the embryo are not going to be all uniform in terms of the genetic complement. And there may be some cells in an embryo 
that may show some abnormalities. And again, there's very little known about the fate of such embryos called mosaic embryos, as the lady refers to mosaic embryos. So what a mosaic embryo means is that by and large, there are normal cells which are genetically normal or healthy, but there are some cells that have shown some form of abnormalities or genetic abnormalities. And this is what adds the hammer in the works, that is this embryo considered to be normal or abnormal? And because they have both kinds of cells, they are categorized as mosaic. The true fate of these embryos has been unknown. And certainly patients may, after genetics counseling, have the right to select what we call a low grade mosaic embryo, whereby there is more normal cells and very few abnormal cells. Because some people believe that to a certain extent, we are all mosaic. The human being is mosaic because the cells in our body are not necessarily all showing the universal genetic complement. Maybe some cells in our kidneys are showing different genetic complement to our liver. So the tissues that we may have in our body may show variations. And again, this may not be an abnormal concept when it comes to development of the embryo because there will be some level of abnormal cells which are going to be sent to different parts of the body. So we can pick this up via mosaicism, but this is where the complexities of the result lie. And when you are in a position that you have a mosaic embryo, and again, I want to reassure viewers by saying that mosaicism is between three and 5%. It is not as high as 40, 50%. It's three to 5% of the embryos may show a mosaic complement. But in the UK, we are not allowed to transfer a genetically normal embryo. So in your question, you make reference to um, you've heard of someone having an abnormal embryo being transferred in the US. I'm not sure if this strictly refers to an abnormal embryo or a mosaic embryo, but you've been very clear in saying it's not mosaic. So I would find it very difficult to accept uh, a clinic transferring a abnormal embryo because who would be taking the risks? Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for explaining that. And there's another question from Angela. You can see, okay, I am a carrier for hereditary fructose intolerance, autosomal, and I'm also a carrier for labor congenial. So sorry, <laughs> not sure how to see mm -hmm. the, uh, read it. Um, and uh, will this impact me in later life? So you, you've got multiple, you know, you carry multiple genetic aberrations. And again, as I, I refer you back to my initial statement that we would not know the impact factor of all these individual genetic um, uh, conditions. And hence a genetics counselor, I think even sometimes genetics counselor would have to look at the reports. They would have to look at the penetration rate. Sometimes, Angela, people carry um, a genetic aberration, but the penetration rate may be very, very low. So it doesn't affect their lifestyle in any way. They simply carry this mutation, but they have a very normal lifestyle. So we also know that the same genetic disorder, if it, if it has got a larger penetration rate, it affects people in a much more in-depth way in terms of their lifestyle. <clears throat> so that's why it is very multifactorial and you would need to have an expert opinion, especially because there's two conditions here that you're talking about. I would certainly get an expert opinion with a consultant clinical geneticist, firstly, and also a genetics counselor. But your first port of call should be a consultant clinical geneticist. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And if you see below, there is a more detailed question from Angela, but I understand uh, this would be quite similar <clears throat> answer. Yes, that uh, mm -hmm. Angela should just uh, get in touch with uh, a specialist. I think a consultant clinical geneticist would be uh, the right port of call for Angela. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much again for that. And uh, if you can see at the um, next question here, would you suggest PGT? with inversion on chromosome 9P12Q13, 35-year-old, three miscarriages with IUI and IVF, or rather egg donation? 
So I'm just looking for that question here again. Sorry, I've just lost it. Uh, it's, uh, it's between the questions from Angela. Yeah. Yes, I've, I've seen that. Perfect. So, um, yeah, you're talking about an inversion of a chromosome. Most likely your miscarriages, I believe, are due to this chromosomal rearrangement, as we call it. What I would suggest you do is wherever you're having your fertility treatment, unless these have been natural miscarriages, which most likely they may well be, I would start the procedure by contacting a fertility clinic that does PGT. Uh, this is PGT uh, for structural rearrangement, as we call it. So it's, it's actually pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and not PGS. So I would firstly get in contact with the clinic that does PGD. Um, you would then, um, they would send your genetics report, which you have because you clearly know where the breakpoints are in your chromosomes. You would take that genetics report, give it to this clinic. The clinic will then need to send it to the genetics laboratory who is going to be doing the uh, genetic testing. They will be able to say whether this, they have a test ready that can screen those breakpoints, if, if, if that makes sense. So only the genetics lab will, able to be, will be able to give you the clearance because there could be so many different breakpoints. And sometimes you may have to wait for about two to three months whilst the lab optimizes the protocol and so on in order to test your embryos for these specific breakpoints. So in terms of uh, a direction for you, please uh, seek um, which is the nearest fertility clinic to you that does PGT. Then take your genetics report during your consultation, pass it over to the consultant. The consultant will then pass it on to the genetics lab. The genetics lab will tell the clinic whether PGD can be done on this specific breakpoints. And if it can be done, then bingo, you should go for PGD. Certainly with um, if, if the attribution of those miscarriages is to do with those chromosomal breakpoints and chromosomal rearrangements, then your best bet is to go towards PGTSR. I, I wouldn't go to egg donation that fast, but again, it's it's totally your call. Yes, uh, one of the options is to change the eggs, especially if you know that you carry that um, th that chromosomal rearrangement. But if you haven't had any kind of genetic testing on your embryos, then it might be worth you attempting that first in the pursuit to have your genetic child. All right, perfect. Again, thank you so much for answering yet another question. There are more to come. So let's have a look at the next question from Rebecca. I often hear the argument by clinics who perform PGTA that older women who produce only a few embryos should not have PGTA, but if they produce multiple embryos, they would advise it. Why would the advice differ based on the number of embryos produced? Surely the reason for PGTA is the same for both scenarios. You're absolutely right, Rebecca, that, um, you know, they could be sometimes variable um, recommendations uh, about PGS on younger women or older women. Now, one of, I, I want to kind of uh, remove some haziness around this uh, decision making. And just to give you some information that what is the basis around uh, the numbers game? So as you know, Rebecca, as women uh, grow older, their ovarian reserve also declines. So younger women may be uh, able to be producing a lot more eggs. And because we know that for any kind of pre-implantation genetic testing, it's important to have the numbers. So for example, as I mentioned, the whole process of PGT requires the embryo to be biopsied. And of course, as you know, as a rule of thumb, the probability of finding a normal embryo is much higher if you have more numbers. So if you have five blastocysts, the chances of you having a normal embryo is much higher rather than you having one blastocyst. So this then ties in with the recommendation that if you do have a lower ovarian reserve, then your doctor may recommend you not to have PGS. Now, in my opinion, I would still feel that it is <clears throat> women 
who are older and yet potentially don't have the ovarian reserve are, in my opinion, more in need of PGS. So what I generally recommend to these patients is they may need multiple cycles of IVF. We call it embryo banking. So for example, if we know that in one cycle, you can only typically produce four eggs or something like that, or low numbers, and you may only have one embryo being formed every time, then what my recommendation would be is to attempt multiple cycles of IVF, whereby we're trying to get four eggs every time and creating an embryo and freezing those embryos. And once we've frozen all the embryos, we do a biopsy on those embryos all at one go to identify which one is the normal embryo so that we can transfer that. So I would not take away PGT from older women with low ovarian reserve. I would encourage them to consider what we call embryo banking. Fantastic. Thank you so much once again for your explanation. And next question is, what is your take on non-invasive PGTA since apparently there is a DNA in the blastos so sorry, fluid mm -hmm. of blastosis and in the spandemers culture media, is it accurate, uh, as, as accurate as the traditional biopsy method? This is a very good question and I'm absolutely super amazed at our audience today. I must say that there is <laughs> So much amazing knowledge. And I, th this question has blown me away because this is so new science, Caroline, that for someone to talk about non-invasive PGTA, they are really on the ball. So well done, whoever you are, because you haven't given me your identity here. But uh, uh, basically what non-invasive PGTA is, it's a very novel and new technology which is still under validation. So you are right. Embryos when they develop, they release some DNA in the fluid in the middle of the embryo called the blastocele fluid. So this fluid that is in the middle of the embryo has the DNA and subsequently this DNA may enter the culture media as well in which the embryo is growing. So what non-invasive PGTA is, is literally just taking a sample of that fluid in which or the culture media in which the embryo is growing and sending that to the genetic slab rather than performing any kind of invasive biopsy which can potentially damage the embryo and again as i said if done in the skillful hands it wouldn't damage it but there's always that theoretical risk that it is an invasive procedure here we're talking about a process whereby there is no invasive procedure we're literally taking that spent culture media and sending it to the genetic slab and they're doing the uh, genetic analysis now to answer your question this is still under research and development we believe that this technology is still about a year away from being applied clinically the technique is very promising i must say uh, from in fact i just had a conversation a few days ago with the genetics lab who is developing this technology for clinical use to apply it with patients and they told me that the robustness is just over 80 percent at the moment but for any procedure to be clinically validated we want the robustness or the validation to be over 90 percent accurate so i think there is still some time to go some more validation studies need to be done on the accuracy of this test compared to the current invasive tests that we're doing. But watch the space. It's very promising. And I'm sure in the next year or year and a half, non-invasive PGTA is going to be a clinical reality. Fantastic. That is indeed very promising and interesting. So thank you so much for that question for sure as well. That's excellent. Thank you so much. And so you have already mentioned the next question, but if you could uh, repeat that, what is the cost of PGT? So typically uh, to do PGTA, which is aneuploidy screening, it's around 500 pounds per embryos, but clinics can be quite variable in, 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 their, in their charges. Um, you know, at IVF London in our clinic, uh, we charge 500 per embryos, but there is a cap of 3,300 at the most. Whether you have, uh, after which, whether you have five embryos or 10 embryos, you would not pay more than 3,300. So that is the, uh, the, the top level that any couple would be spending if they're going to be having PGTA. But if they only have one embryo to biopsy 
or two embryos to biopsy, they're only going to be charged per embryo, which is 500. <clears throat> okay, excellent. Thank you so much once again. And um, next question is, uh, actually, you have mentioned this, okay, but if you could perhaps add anything. So, I am adopted and have normal carrier type, could be a carrier of genetic disease that causes my implantation failure. Should I have a genetic test in my case? Um, certainly, I think if you've had multiple implantation failures, it might be worth your clinic investigating your reasons for failure to conceive. And I would suggest that the karyotype is one such test that both you and your partner need to have before you, and before you go through any further treatment. Okay. And again, your GP could do this for you as long as your clinic, um, if, you, if you live in the UK, then if uh, your, your clinic um, may refer you to your GP to for your GP to do all these tests. So from a cost perspective, you are not uh, you, you're not subjected to more costs because these tests are not cheap, such as the karyotype. OK, thank you again for that. And um, next question is right here. I am 41, has three cycles of IVF last year with PGS due to my age and history of type D and first to DM. First cycle two abnormal, second cycle four abnormal and two quality insufficient for interpretation. Third cycle six no abnormal, three quality insufficient again. What are the possible reasons for quality insufficiency? So what, what, what I understand when she's saying quality insufficient, it means that there was not a conclusive result that was obtained for that embryo. However, um, I'm quite amazed at the high level of or the high numbers of which embryo. So potentially out of six, you, you, you said in your third cycle, you had six abnormal, three insufficient. So I'm presuming you had nine embryos out of which six were abnormal and three were inconclusive or could not be diagnosed. And I find three out of nine to be quite a high number. So I would really question the biopsy in the first place. And most importantly, I would also question the genetics lab it's going to. Again, we want to make sure that the clinic that where these procedures are being done is very robustly equipped with skill and expertise to be taking biopsies. So a biopsy is a very, very skillful procedure. Some embryologists take very few cells, which may not be enough to get a result. So the reasons could be very far and wide. Um, and I, 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 I'm sorry, it doesn't help you, but um, certainly to get three out of nine embryos inconclusive, I would really start questioning things that why is it so high? Patient has actually added, yes, 12 embryos in total, three quality insufficient. Yeah, I would still say that to get usually inconclusive results are very rare. They're very rare. Usually we would get a result from every embryo. 99.7% of the embryos in my experience give a result. So what I'm not sure here is when she says quality insufficient, did she mean that they did not reach the blastocyst stage so a biopsy could be done? In which case, that is expected. Not every embryo is going to make it to the blastocyst. So if quality insufficient means it did not make it to blastocyst, then that's normal. I would not question anything there. But if it means that there was a biopsy taken but there was no result, then that would concern me. The patient has also added that is what the report states. They were blastocysts. Okay. So it, it, it means that there was no result. Then I would certainly question this a bit more from a clinic perspective uh, in which she's had treatment. Okay. Thank you, Miguel, for clarifying that to us. Okay. Next question is here. How accurate is PGS? What is the margin of error? Very good question. And I think every patient reserves the right to know this because it's important that patients do embark on choosing PGS knowing what the flows can be. No technique can be 100%. PGS is also not 100%. The accuracy of PGS is anything from 95 to 98%. There is that small 
rate of error whereby they potentially could be a misdiagnosis of an embryo. Um, you know, because we the genetics lab is is basing the diagnosis on just a very few cells. So we know, as I explained earlier, that there are concepts in the embryos whereby all the cells may not be uniform. You may be taking a snapshot of an embryo from one side, and yet the other side is showing a completely different genetic status. Okay, so this is not necessarily a flaw of the technique, but it is simply the dynamics of embryonic development. So I think the answer to your question is that PGS is quite accurate because it does translate into pregnancy rates, which are actually um, quite high, in my opinion. So if there was a high level of inaccuracy in the technique, then we would see that the pregnancy rates would not sit hand in hand with the whole technique. But we know that when we get genetically normal embryos, the pregnancy rates expected are very high. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for once again answering that question. And next one is right here. Is there any test that I can do if I have an underlying health condition, hypothyroidism, pre-diabetic, a uh, partner has thalassemia and I don't want my baby to have it? So again, I would, uh, you know, uh, it, it depends on the thalassemia as well, whether it's thalassemia major or not. So again, you need to be seen by an expert consultant geneticist. And if you completely want to remove the carrier status of the thalassemic uh, condition, then yes, by having PGD, you can select embryos which are completely free of even the carrier status. But as you know, with thalassemia, it, it's a condition whereby two carriers have to potentially come together. But I think, as I said, this is something uh, I'm not an expert at, at all these individual genetic disorders. I would certainly recommend that you take expert advice from a consultant clinical geneticist before you plan your family. Because if you are planning to have kids and you definitely want to remove this gene from your gene pool, even if your partner is a carrier and even if your child can potentially can only be a carrier, but the risk still would be there for the baby when he or she gets married and she carries this gene and she has to make sure that her partner is free from being a carrier. So many patients just choose to eradicate the gene whilst the technology is available to do so. Okay, thank you once again for that and uh, next question is right here my pg is normal embryo failed to implant even though i have had immune testing receptivity testing and all psychological errors ruled out uh, physiological errors of course ruled out is it mm -hmm. possible that my eggs are of poor quality metabolically so again it's a good question um, a, a genetically normal embryo or a golden embryo doesn't necessarily mean or guarantee a pregnancy we know that even with pgs the, the top most success rates as published by many studies is around 70%, okay? So there's still a 30% chance that the embryo may not implant. Unfortunately, a miscarriage or a failure to implant is not necessarily only related to the chromosomal status of the embryo. Yes, by, and by, by large it is, but it is not the only reason why embryos fail to implant. And of course, you're referring to having immunological tests done, et cetera, et cetera. But it simply may just be, if you've just had one failed embryo transfer, whereby a golden embryo was transferred and it did not implant, it may simply be chance. So if you do have another golden embryo in the freezer, it might be worth giving it another shot. So as I said, the chances of pregnancy, even with euploid or golden embryos is around 70%. It's not 100. Okay. Thank you so much once again. And, and, and sorry, can I just add, and, and you made reference to embryo quality as well. So it may, obviously I don't have that information, but Again, if the embryo quality is a bit more inferior, that then, then that may also be the reason why these genetically normal embryos may not implant because they are, they are inferior in quality. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank you. And now let's have a look at the next question. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Here it is. What about NGS techniques comparing to PGTA and PGTM? Um, so for PGTA, the technique used nowadays is next generation sequencing. For PGTM, which is a different web, which is re relating to PGD uh, for a single gene disorder or monogenic disorder, as it's called, and that's why it's called PGTM because M refers to monogenic. So, for example, when I say monogenic disorders, I'm, I'm referring to what we call the single gene mutations, such as cystic fibrosis, thalassemia breast cancer, etc. For these techniques or the monogenic disorders, the technique used by the genetics lab is called carrier mapping. Okay, so these are different genetic tests. Of course, it still relies on some key basic principles of amplifying the DNA from the single cells that are taken or the small cluster of cells that are taken. So the basic principles are the same, but the platforms are very different. So there is no one test for all. It really depends on the test and the genetic condition that is being looked for. Okay, thank you again for that. And now let's have a look at the next uh, question. Okay, there are two very, I mean, the same questions. I will read one of them. Okay, so with embryo banking in advance of PGS, do you need to defrost the first batch biopsy and then refreeze or can the biopsy be done on the fresh embryos of the first batch and somehow stored until uh, the second batch is ready? It's a very good question, Emily, and uh, you, you're absolutely right. That is definitely a possible strategy as well, that embryos can be biopsied fresh and the cells that are biopsied are stored in a minus 80 freezer. Okay, so if the cells are stored in minus 80 degrees in a freezer, yes, you can batch the cells, which means that there would only be one freeze that the embryo would have to go through. But routinely, many clinics do embryo batching or embryo banking in a manner whereby they would um, freeze the embryos, they would defrost the embryos, take the biopsies, and then refreeze the embryos. We know that refreezing embryos works perfectly well. There is absolutely no risks apart from a very tiny risk that the embryo may not survive the freezing process again. But it's, it's a less than 2% risk. But both the strategies are very viable and it can be done either way um, as, as you detailed. Okay, excellent. Thank you again. And uh, next question you actually kind of answered so already, but if you could any add anything, is there a risk of damaging a blastocyst when taking a biopsy resulting in it no longer being able to be transferred? Clearly extremely ex upsetting if results had come back showing it was good for transfer. Absolutely, there is always a risk. Uh, even in the best of hands, there is a risk. But in my experience, I have not seen your, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, it could happen, but I have not seen an embryo damage as a result of biopsy. Again, I teach the biopsy procedure around the world. I go around training embryologists around the world to do this procedure, which is a highly skilled procedure. And I have seen some embryologists who, 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 who do damage these embryos. So it can happen. Okay, and you're right. It would be very upsetting if the only embryo that you had normal but was damaged by the biopsy. I mean, that would that would really be upsetting. I can understand that. But yes, you have identified that there is a risk. And in my opinion, this risk is theoretical. Um, if you go to a clinic who, whereby they know what they're doing and how they're doing it, then these risks are very negligible. Okay, excellent. Thank you again for clarifying this. Next question is right here. I am looking at genetic testing for NF1, but the clinic is do looking at the three testing of the embryo and will test for the common five chromosomes, including the NF1 instead of day five, and then having transfer within the same cycle. Is this type of day three testing okay instead of day five? The answer is no. I do not recommend the embryos being tested on day three. 
for various reasons. Because firstly, there have been enough studies that have shown that if you're going to be testing for the five chromosomes on day three, you will not get accurate results. You will not get accurate results. So as much as you may test for the NF1 gene, but when it comes to the common chromosomes, the XY 18, 13, 21, you're not going to get accurate results, which may lower your chances of getting pregnant. Okay, so there is no reason why the clinic you are at cannot do a day five biopsy unless they do not have the skills to do it. But the most common way of doing it and how every clinic should be doing it, and as I said, I'm quite fortunate to be in a capacity that I travel the world teaching this technology and I condemn day three testing because it is inaccurate. So there's a lot of drawbacks about testing embryos on day three. And I think it is within my responsibility to guide patients to say, please do not have your embryos tested on day three just because you want a fresh embryo transfer. No, because the perils are more in doing that. Yes, you will have a fresh embryo transfer, but you are not really going to be doing justice to something that you're really highly investing in, which is the genetic testing. Let's get that right. That's what is really important. So don't worry about the freezing of the embryos and having a frozen embryo transfer. Let's make sure that the diagnosis that you've been given is absolutely accurate and robust. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much again for clarifying that. We have like two questions left and this will mm -hmm. be, we will be slowly finishing. But if you have any questions left, just go ahead and type them in. And next question is right uh, here. Okay, are embryo biopsied for PGS which have not reached the blastocyst stage more likely to return as quality insufficient for interpretation? Very good question. So my answer to that question is that most likely, yes. If the embryos have not made it to the blastocyst, we know that the most likely reason for this embryo not to develop to the blastocyst is a chromosomal disorder or a chromosomal error. So embryos that do not make it to blastocyst, by and large, have chromosomal errors and hence they have stopped growing in the laboratory. So the answer to the question is most likely these embryos are not genetically normal. Okay, excellent. And it looks the next one is our last question. Okay, if you could just simply answer, it's, it's a short one. In, is NGS different to PGT? NGS is a technique that is used for PGT. PGT just stands for pre-implantation genetic testing. And NGS is a specific methodology for PGT. And so is karyomapping. So the, the technology of testing is called PGT. And the specific test that does the PGT is called next generation sequencing. Okay, excellent. Thank you once again for explaining this. In the meantime, we have one more question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned to make sure the lab you use is top quality. How can you check this yourself? It's very difficult. I mean, when I say top quality, I, I mean that, you know, because from everything that I've explained in terms of the expertise of the embryologist, the questions to ask from if you are a patient in terms of how to determine the standards of the laboratory is look at what their pregnancy rates are with PGT embryos. So ask them for the stats, ask them that what is the pregnancy rate in patients who have had PGT? Look at what the miscarriage rates are as well, because this is where you're really gonna get that information that is that clinic specializing in biopsying human embryos? Because as I said, if the expertise is not there, you could be doing more damage than good to those embryos. All right, excellent. And it looks like that was our last question. And as you can see, many, many patients are already thanking you for this session. And well, 
very helpful, informative. Uh, thank you very much for your great answers. Enjoy your evening. Uh, amazing. So those are just a few comments. You can see them right here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alpesh, for joining our Stronger Together initiative. It's a pleasure to have you here. Lots of interesting information you have provided. And uh, thank you. To our Absolutely patient. my pleasure. Thank you so much, Caroline. Absolutely a pleasure interacting with you and obviously all, all the viewers that have really been um, engaging with us. I, I really appreciate engaging conversations and uh, I wish everyone to be safe and well. And if any one of you has any other questions that they can think about when it comes to um, uh, you know genetics or embryology or even IVF, do send us an email uh, or do send me an email on info at ivflondon.co.uk. I also offer free 15, 20 minute mini consultations for any patients who wish to discuss fertility treatment and pre-implantation genetic testing. So please do reach out to us um, on various uh, modalities by telephone, email, or through our website as well. So as I said, there's absolutely no obligation uh, consultation that we offer. I hope today has been useful to all of the viewers and I look forward to hearing from any one of you with any more questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Definitely a pleasure to have you. As you can see the comments, I don't need to. Uh, that's I, I, I think that speaks for itself, right? <laughs> and well, thank you again, all of you for joining our uh, webinars and just wanted to remind everyone that you will be able to re-watch this session as well within the next few days. It will be uploaded on our website, myivfanswers.com and uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and that way once it's ready and uploaded you will have uh, you will receive an email so that's definitely useful as well go ahead and uh, subscribe in such case and well i will be back here tomorrow at 6 p.m uk time and at 8 p.m uk time and i hope you will be able to join us as well and ask more questions to some other experts as well dr alpesh thank you so much for uh, again, you. it has been a pleasure to have you here and have a lovely evening and I hope we can do it again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Thank Stay you. safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.